Today, I want to welcome Paul Anand to the show. He is the man behind the Wrestling Card Price Guide. And I first heard from Paul via some interviews with Zan Morning and Tony Vela, but now we get a chance to have a conversation of our own. So, Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, Mike. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here. Well, we will get to the Wrestling Card Price Guide site, but first I want to learn a little bit more about you and your collecting background. Sure. And so how did you get started collecting cards? Well, when I was a kid up here in Canada, hockey cards was was the biggest thing. So my dad used to come home at night and bring me packs. And I was into hockey cards and some non-sports, Star Wars and 77, that kind of thing. And then um, I had a, a fairly decent hockey card collection. And, and it's, it's funny because when I started my first business, true story, I had some rookie Gretzky's. Now, back then, they were worth hundreds, not millions. <laughs> but um, I'd actually sold a bunch of those. And, and the guy basically raped me because I didn't know it was worth. I got rid of them all. But I remember in, in the gym bag the adidas bag i had there was um a wrestling set and i said oh no you know what i want to keep those because i actually put that set together and what those were were the 85 opg which is the equivalent of the tops but i actually remember i was a teenager at the teenager at that time it's like oh wrestling and i'd always been into wrestling probably more so than anything else but there were no cards um back then so when those ones came out um, i remember putting that set together and that's all i kept and got rid of all the hockey <laughs> including the, the rookie greskies and i kept those and from there, Mike had just mushroomed. I just bought the next one and the next one. And I've been a master set collector whereby I try and accumulate every set that comes out. But it's gotten a little silly with indie sets. But we do those and uh, over 33,000 pieces now of individual cards. You know, it's gotten a little tricky over the last year with Panini, but we're still battling away. So was, so that pivot point of kind of when you were trying to raise some money to start your business keeping that one wrestling set that was kind of the pivot point of what focused you in to be kind of wrestling only at this point well at that point at that point i was a young guy starting a business so i had other things on my mind other than trading cards i was out of the hobby pretty much and you know i, I got the cash from my hockey but i just remember keeping the wrestling only because it was around the time of wrestlemania or just shortly thereafter and i was still watching and i just kept it because like oh you know what i actually collected these wrestling cards and a uh, little one day I'll look back and say, look, I got these tops or OPG cards. Didn't didn't realize that the next one will come out. And then I grabbed those. And so, yeah, so that, that was the start of it. But I started at the time. I actually collected the 85, uh, uh, they're called Pro Wrestling Stars, at the time that they came out. And I've done so pretty much throughout. I've, I, you know, I, I got the Wrestling All-Stars along the way. Um, but by and large, when a set comes out, I've, I've gotten it. How about all of these? Canadian oddballs that I've fell, fallen in love with over the last the few years. Mostly the, food stuff. Yeah, the Quaker um, Dips, yeah, the Stewarts, yeah. the Swansons. Yeah, all I know you're fond of the uncut sheet. Yeah, I've got all of those and the wee stickers. And uh, but we had like the Parkhurst in the fifties, and yeah. um, you know the, the the Quaker Dips and what are the other ones called? Or the, there's the Dips, and then there's another. There's, there's another. A, the Swanson food. The but Swanson there's two Quakers. Yeah. There's the Dips and and another set of those as well. I didn't know that. The, yeah, the dips, I, I know there's an 88 and an 89 dip set. So um, that's what that it is. Maybe two dips, sorry, so maybe it's two dips, but okay. And that that I believe is the first warrior, isn't it? That's yeah, the, the 88 was the first warrior. I, I believe that there's maybe another one from that same year that came in a different product, but and so time like I don't know if the dips came out before this other right. food issue. No, I, I love, I love other stuff like oddball that, set, or, but where someone like Warrior turns up on something like that first. Yeah. Because now, of course, invariably the conversation is going to round to what come around to when the card sets come out as the which is the one. But yeah. it's nice to say, uh uh, uh here's something even that predates. Yeah. Um and I have that with my 95 Panini set. It's a it's a very short printed test run of actual cards put up by Miss Panini, a hundred card set that has the four triple H first ever triple H cards. Okay. Um, you know. But it's always fun to have those uh, rather than it being clear cut. Oh, this is definitely the first one of these. Yeah, it's it's neat. And so there's I just had a lot of fun tracing, tracking down those um, the Stewarts that came with, yep, with some of those cake, which products. are paper, but because they're shaped like cards and they're numbered. Yeah. Yep. And I, I was a guy, to be honest, for the longest time that that was 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 uh, what's this? This isn't a card. It's not a paper, particularly with the magazine stuff from the 70s. 
But then PSA started grading them and enough people in the hobby started adopting them. And I realized, okay, it's not for me to say. Um, not that I've gone out and, and, and got them myself, but uh, we do recognize those as well. And then that opens the description as to what's a card. You know, I get into Valentine's cards. I get into anything that's a piece of cardboard with a wrestler. I certainly do postcards. I don't do stickers. And sometimes the different between a sticker and a card is very, very blurry. So uh, it's just all fun. You know, as a collector, being an archivist and sort of because I've been sort of into it along the way and and, and, and collecting it, um, I started just writing about it. Yep. Who Who is your favorite wrestler? I would say Flair. You know, um, I, I love Undertaker. Certainly appreciate Hogan and Austin for what they've done. Love The Rock. Like the top 10 guys that you would put, Michaels, those are all. But I think if I had to pick one, Flair, because when I was a kid, that was the time of the Four Horsemen, you know, when you're impressionable and it, and it first takes. And I have a memory at the Maple Leaf Gardens of seeing Ric Flair. He used to have a curfew match that they'd wrestle until 11 o'clock. And I think it was it was Flair against Harley for like 45 minutes, Harley race. And that changed my life. <laughs> and I think I was very close. And I saw that. And I, I still remember that vividly, like in his prime. Uh, it was something, Mike. So, you know, I would say Flair and then everybody else. And a lot of people, oh, Flair's gotten dirty in his old age or whatever, you know, but that doesn't bother me, you know. In his prime, you know, even when he won the Royal Rumble in that stretch uh, when he was with the WWF, it doesn't get any better than that for me. Who's your favorite wrestler to collect? Is that also Flair or is it somebody else? No, I collect everybody, you know. So, you know, our friend Chuck made an interesting point. When you're a master collector, you PC everybody because, you know, like your Norman Smiley stuff, I would have most of them because I have the WCW sheets. I have all the main things that he was in. So unless he was in something very odd, he'd be in there as would everybody else. Um, it's more so, it's more so, it's, they used to call us completists. Now that term's kind of, kind of gone by the wayside because with parallels and everything, it's impossible to be a completist anymore. And that all started back in 2006 with, with the top heritage sets. But uh, I'd collect them all. Like I'd, I'd collect the base card, which is normally a 90, 99 or 100 card set. And then you have your insert cards, you know, 10, 15, some are larger. And I get those. So not any one performer in particular, but uh, just staying up with all the major releases. Do you have a favorite set? Yeah, I like that Panini set I just mentioned. Also, the WCW autographs that came out over a three-card set back in 99. Um, I have all 106 of those, plus a couple of really rare ones that are really cool. Um, I really like the 2010 Topps Platinum uh, in and of itself, just for the way that set was put together. Um, I got so many of them that there's a bunch, but those four in, in particular would be ones that come to mind first. So what inspired you to start the price guide? All right, this goes back to a guy that's not around anymore. We don't even know he's around around anymore, um, named Grimm. And Grimm was one of the first sort of custodians of wrestling cards back in the early days. When I say early days, like early days of the internet, 97, 98, 99, I think his, his, his site came on board 98-ish. And he was actually a heavy buyer of Flair product at the time, which had the WWF license, or was about to. It was comic images leading into Flair. And he put up the first site, which was called, I believe, Wrestling Card Universe. And he had a very sort of gothic look to him. He had it like the Grim Reaper logo and all this stuff. And he sort of became the guy. He was first. Tony Tony was just coming online then, but he had Com Collect and hadn't started WrestlingTradingCards.com yet. So Grim was the guy. And I bought a lot of my early sets from him. Um, it's just easier because I'm not a guy that rips a lot of boxes. I let the rippers do that, assemble a set, and then I find the guy who wants to sell me the cheapest. So I, I used to buy a lot of stuff from Grimm, including when Fleer went out of business, we got a lot of their closeout stuff, and that really uh, boosted my collection because I was able to buy a lot of their stuff uh, for pennies on the dime. But Grimm and I started chatting about doing a price guide, and we'd never met each other. We'd never even seen each other this way. This stuff didn't exist. And um, so we started working on it, and just by coincidence, a friend of mine got into the bookbinding business. We used to make CDs and cassettes, and he sort of tooled into that. So we had the opportunity to get it done real in inexpensively. And then I realized from my uh, spreadsheets for my personal collection, I had a lot of this stuff already done. So it was just a matter of organizing it all. And then Grim, with his expertise, he got all the pricing, and a lot of the pricing, which is out of date now, still goes back to that. And we put out the book. It was the first. It came out in 2010. And I should mention Tony at the time. And I didn't know Tony that well. Broker to deal with TriStar to get me the back cover advertising their last or their latest set, which was very cool. Um, and we put out the book. I made 500 of them. I sold about maybe a 375 or so. Um, so, you know, didn't didn't make a ton of money, but I didn't lose. And um, that was the book. And then about a year later, two years later, I, I my wife, who's now a web designer, created the site where we basically took the book put it online and then I just I've just kept up with it throughout and it's been 10 years now or so we just celebrated our 10th year of having the, the online version 
So it started as a, a paper price guide, kind of the, the old traditional way that we all used to, right. to look at, at prices and then convert it into the, yeah, the website. market and book and high and low and all that stuff. Yep. Traditional. And it was a book. It was a good sized book. It went from the beginning of, of, you know, the first tobacco cards all the way to 2009. I think it was uh, WW 2009 set. And that's it. You know, some of the TriStar was in there. Um but then we decided, I decided, you know what, I'm not going to make a book again. You know, yeah. I'm just going to keep this stuff online and I can go in and update prices as I need to. Now, it's been difficult to go back and, you know, life and trying to get it all done all the time. But the whole idea is that you just have a very rough guide of some of the more uh, interesting pieces in a set that might be worth a little more. You know, if you're looking at a FLIR set and you're going down and everything's five bucks and then something's 60, you're like, oh, what's this? And there's a reason why rare print or something would have you. And it's just that kind of resource, which never existed up until that point. How at this point, you know, you had mentioned as some of the initial pricing came from the uh, the original Grimm, right? Is is what yep. his name was. Yeah. How do you go about establishing prices now? Or you've got it's so comprehensive. Sure. How do you well? First of all, think about going all, back to provide you, any kind of updates with the 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 way that we've seen the market take off right. over these last few years. Since I don't have a staff and I'm just doing this myself, I mean, I have Chuck helping me out. Um, we have historical data, right? We, we have eBay stuff. First way, you throw away all the parallels because there's no rhyme or reason for, for what they may be worth. And it just got crazy trying to figure out, okay, if you have this level parallel, it may be worth 3X or whatever. Um, uh, the market tells you, I'm buying the sets as I'm going along, remember, Mike? So I know what I've paid for the master set before shipping to get here to Toronto. And that gives me an idea in general what a set should be worth. Then we start looking at insert sets. Um, and they're generally a little bit more than the base, depending what they got. And then you go on eBay and if you see all of a sudden something's trending high because it's limited number and then you sort of get a, a feel for it, you know, year after year after year. Now, of course, Panini comes along this year and everything's thrown out the window. And in fact, if you look at my last two or three Panini sets, the prices aren't even there yet because there's this phenomenon of settled market. Things go for a lot more in the early days because everyone's trying to get and then after a while things settle well what we're after is the settle prices so and tony and i do that on our monthly show we sort of do cross tabulated looks at what certain sets are getting for month after month and then we look at the top sales just to get some sort of science into it as best as you can for something like wrestling cards um to be able to track the market properly and you know i'm it, it's not an exact science by any stretch and it's not something that's constantly updated that's why it's called guide so you know i don't want people throwing me saying you know what you're way off on this you're way off on that yes i know <laughs> you know what i mean but yeah. i'll tell you sometimes i'll go to buy a card and someone will say no 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 it's worth this much as says the wrestling card price guide <laughs> and uh you know how so it's, it sounds like you know it's definitely one of the things i like is it's definitely comprehensive and it can definitely help point out some of these older releases that are more limited more now, rare all, or regional all, issues show, show you what's there you know yep. like WrestlingTrainingCards.com and Wrestling Price Guide. We work together, and Tony and I have always, always at the outset when Tony disappeared for a number of years. So I sort of picked things up with Chuck, and him and I were sort of the main source. And then when COVID hit, and you know it got more popular again, Tony came back. We started talking about okay, well, got this big mess of a website here that needs to. If if something, I I I didn't want to take it on, so I was glad he was willing to sort of resurrect it. And then three of us sort of worked out a way that we could work together to get it going. And I said to Tony at the outset, I said, look. We've always been friends and this hobby stronger with the two of us working together. So we put our eggs in one basket and and, uh, and away we went. But that's just it. You can go to Price Guide and flip and see quickly what's there, you know, and you can search by you're looking for a Valentine's card or a Leafs card. And you can see, and because I don't have to do as much work as Tony does with listing all the base cards, because that's really the strength of WTC, I can get things up a little quicker. The one thing I also have too is um, video flips where you can sort of see what these cards actually look like in real life. And they're just cards from my collection. So it gives you an idea that when you have a big collection, it's something else that you can sort of value add to a page just for people to see. Yeah, you do. You mentioned Tony a few times now, Tony Vela from WrestlingTradingCards.com. Yeah. You guys have a show together that you do on the Wrestling um, Trading Cards channel. How did you guys first meet? Well, I, I remember talking to Tony 20 years back when he had Com Collect because he was doing, I think, Buffy, some wrestling cards, and I believe Playboy cards. And I was into wrestling, and everything was new at that time, Mike. So it's like some dude in California, hey, I'm into wrestling cards up in Toronto. And I remembered the name, and he remembered me. And then fast forward, the odd interaction here and there. And then when I was doing the book, and um, David and Tony were running wrestling trading cards, 
I went to them and I said, look, guys, I'll give you a page in here to advertise. And he appreciated that. And he said, well, I can help you get some some something for the back. That was sort of our first interaction. And to be honest, we didn't really ever meet until I did the first video with him back in 2020. Just mm -hmm. when he started doing his first show, he said, come on and introduce yourself. And then we just became friendly from there because we realized that, okay, things are starting to happen with the, within the hobby and it needs a little bit of organization. You know, it's sort of, there's these disparate elements, but we're small enough now that if you and I and a couple of other key people sort of figure out a way to present the information and we did, we went to the national uh, this last year for the first time and just get the sort of outside world knowing us a little better then of course Panini's helped us a great deal with that as well just a much larger audience coming in and we've grown you know we've and we've seen the growth um you know just as we were talking off off offline earlier so even some friction within the hobby is is often a, a demonstration of, of of something that's growing you know yep you know you mentioned the growth that we're starting to see and relatively speaking wrestling is still a, a niche segment of Absolutely. the card collecting hobby yeah. but it's a growing segment sure what has you excited about the wrestling card hobby right now? Well, the fact that the growth is there, the fact that more people are coming in, you know, it's an interesting time with what's going on with fanatics, right? So we don't know where the licenses are going to go. You know, the Panini sets, I grumble because I'm a set collector and it's very difficult to be that anymore. But, um, you know, they're knocking them out of the park. They, they, the hobby on our side has never seen product like this before. We've never seen cards as beautiful as a white sparkle prism. We've never seen a gold-based card go for 30 grand, you know? So these are... This is all new territory for us, and and I think it's great. You know, I went to the national this past year, and it used to be, uh, if I go down there, I'd be I'd be frightened to say I was into wrestling. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you would you wouldn't admit it. Now, not only do you admit it, that but other people, are, oh yeah, that's cool. I've heard more wrestling. I've seen more wrestling. We have a show up here in Toronto called Sport Expo. There's wrestling stuff all over the place because this is a real wrestling town. But the wrestling card hobby, on a whole, sort of galvanizing with people in the UK and Australia, and sort of. A bunch of us key guys that are into it on a daily basis just just for fun it's a hobby for us as well we, we don't make money at this we just do this for the love of it um you know we've sort of created this um this community which is uh which is great and you're a part of it yeah i think it's really cool and and now we've got you know both wwe we've got aew as a competitor both yep. on the the actual content side but also on sure. the card side with panini eventually tops or or fanatics taking it back over but oh, now competing go. with upper deck from from the aew products that upper deck is putting out and you've seen even some of the more independent circuits or some of the the smaller the smaller operations putting out Not their own um, box sets and things like that as well it just seems like we've seen a huge proliferation of of content of card content coming out over these last couple of years as well which is is just cool to see mm -hmm. It started with Tops really in 2018. They started really going a little crazy with their with the amount of sets they were putting out, and they got a little repetitive. But you know, the the hobby sort of caught up to it. There's not a lot of stuff that doesn't get made by the manufacturer unless they know they can ship it out their back door. And and people like Leaf and Tops and Upper Deck, you know, they're selling out. So, uh, and, and you mentioned Indy. There's a new Indy set coming out every week somewhere. You know, it's 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 really because you know you can make cards now. There's custom sets, not that they're being sold, but you just see a lot of this stuff. And and this stuff doesn't used to exist. The fact that I could talk to someone like you, that's a peripheral guy in wrestling, but appreciates it as it relates to your overall business. You know, that wasn't something that likely would happen. But guys like Zan and Tony with their YouTube channels are finding new people, and to be honest, a lot more people are finding us. Um, and our people are wrestling fans. They just didn't realize that the wrestling card hobby had sort of um, the juice that it did. You know, people think Star Wars and people think UFC, um, but wrestling's been around for a long time. Just go to my site and look at the hundreds and hundreds of listings that are there, you know, and you can see it all and get a sense. You've been a lifelong collector. You've you've been an archivist, as you said, right? Archiving all of these products. And we had years where there was one, two, a handful of of, of products that came out. And now, as we've been talking these last several minutes, it's the, the popularity has been growing significantly. We've had more and more, more products coming out. We have more and more people entering the wrestling card collecting universe, right? And while that's brought some of the good things that we've just talked about, you also touched on maybe one of those things <clears throat> that have, has also come in, some friction that we've seen. I was just curious, based on your experience, what are some of the things that you see as pain points in this current kind of emerging world that we're seeing from a, a wrestling well, card perspective? Well, there, was, there was there was a bit of a there's a bit of a shift between some of the old school sort of vintage collectors and what we call the new modern gold shiny guys. You know, they like to buy the rare stuff. 
And PRISM came along, and of course, we knew that that would bring outside people, people that were into the PRISM band, and, and whether they like wrestling or not, it didn't matter. It just knew what the value of a black or gold PRISM was on the secondary market. Um, so we weren't naive to that, you know, and there's guys in our hobby that are very well versed in PRISM in all of its forms, you know, that, that collect wrestling. So, so you know, we, 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 we were ready. But what ended up happening is that the, the, the prison box came out and um, the value started going up and some of the pro prism guys started sort of pushing it. They were very bullish on it. And then it reached a point and then it nosedived really fast. And it had the sort of classic look of a pump and dub, you know, and, and people say that's absolutely what it was. But there was a myriad of factors that sort of caused it, notwithstanding the secondary market comes along and then there was a bit of you know, disagreement about one of these, what some of these higher end uh, cards were worth. Some of these things were selling privately, so they couldn't be verified. I was vocal on that sense, because for me, it's like, hey, if it's not verifiable, then we can't go out saying that something is worth something because I heard from a guy kind of thing. So really, and that that to me is one of the sticking points still in the hobby is the value of a gold rock prism, because you know, one side thinks A, the other side thinks B. And we're actually probably going to be having a show on this because not like we'll ever figure it out, Mike, but it's one of, like you say, the, the sticking points. Um, but like anything, when you grow and you bring on, you bring in new people and, you know, sometimes people are a little quick on their fingers when they type something and people get offended, whether right for you or wrongfully, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's just, you know, um, we we the more people that come, the more, the more you might have a few people that don't see eye to eye on things. I've always been, hey, how rare is it that we both have this strange thing in common that we like to, to have a piece, you know, men in tights on pieces of cardboard and we, kind of, we enjoy that. But uh, you know, when money gets involved, people buy for the investment of it, you know, cause trouble. <laughs> One more question. And it's something that I always like to ask the more experienced wrestling card collectors, because a few years ago, I was in that situation where I was a, a lifelong sports card collector I watched wrestling, you know, throughout my childhood and the college years, but I hadn't really dug in deep to collect wrestling cards. And I was struggling with how do I even get started? What makes sense? Because for whatever reason, I wasn't making that connection well, between I connecting or collecting traditional, you know, main four sports cards and wrestling cards. So I always like to say, if there's somebody out there who is like me, who's trying to, to get in or wants to dabble in wrestling cards and learn more about it and kind of get their feet wet, any advice or, or tips well, on all how they on, can start to, to dig in? Sure. It all depends on what you're in it for. If you're in it to make a buck, that's a lot different than just in it to collect and enjoy, you know? So if, if, if you didn't have, if you're into wrestling and you thought, oh, this would be a fun hobby to get into because I love wrestling. I'd like to have some cards. Then tell me what you like. What era did you like? What wrestlers did you like? And then I can guide you to some of that product. And it's all out there. It's all on eBay. It's all on ComC. It's all easy to find ultimately. If you're looking to, you know, there's guys like Zan that are very smart at this. They buy and, and even like yourself, you know, that that buy quantity, looking for the right hits, and you know, you 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 build cash flow that way. Um, you know, there's certain sets that you can buy that uh, you know are are good buys. But again, it depends on what your motivation is. But, you know, we, we have the general saying that, you know, buy what you like. And that, that always makes sense because then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've got out of pocket if you've got something that you enjoy anyways. You know, I see Hacksaw Jim and Hacksaw Jim Duggan behind you there. You know, I don't think you bought that because of its value. I think you bought it because you liked it, right? It, that That's what it is. It's always been that way for me. I've never sold a card, to be honest, I didn't have two of, you know, because yeah. I'm a completist. I'm a collector. And, you know, for me, if someone, I've been offered a lot of money for select pieces in my sets, but then that set is useless to me if that one card is missing, right? Right. That's what I'm in it for. But well, other people have, you know, we talk about lanes and there's different ways of collecting these things. And again, the whole thing, a hobby is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be enjoyable. So you have to find your your enjoyment in it. You know, that, that's my first thing is that if you want to get started, great. You know, what is it about wrestling that you enjoy the most? Mm -hmm. And then let's see if we can find the card version of that, you know? Yep. Very cool. Well, hey, if people want to connect with you, if they want to see more about what you've got going on, and where can, I, can, can I ask you one question before we sign off? Oh, sure. I'd love sure. to. Yeah. I'm, I'm, just curious, I'm just very curious because I love this. Uh, why Norman Smiley? He was one of the guys. So one of the, you know, I watched wrestling a lot when I was a kid. And, you know, that was the Hulkster, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Andre the Giant, you know, all of the that era, right? But then the, the second phase when I was watching religiously every week was the attitude era and me and a and a bunch of buddies we'd get together every monday night and watch raw and we'd watch nitro and and for whatever reason norman smiley was one of those guys who was kind of a bit player at the time 
who would come out and we just kind of fell in love with his character that he was playing and um you know he'd come out and master of submission moves and other things that they would you know we know it's funny for me about that in particular just when i heard it because uh, up here in Canada, we didn't have the Superstation. So during the Monday Night Wars, we didn't have the WCW product. But okay. so all I watched was was WWF, WWE. And then when the All Star, or yeah, when the um, yeah, not the All Stars, the WCW Autograph Series came out, that's yep. the first time I'd ever seen Norman Smiley. And okay. just imagine you'd never heard of him, you know. Yeah. And I knew wrestling, right? So who's this Norman Smiley guy? That's and I have that memory of him. Yeah. That the very first time I saw him was on a card and I didn't know who he was because I'd never seen him in all my years prior up here. That's why when I, I I thought it was a bit of an inside joke kind of thing, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It was just one of those guys that we enjoyed watching. And, um, you know, he wasn't one of the main superstars at the time, but he was yeah. somebody that we got a kick out of and that we connected with. And so, and, then, and so as I was, you know, looking for a way to get reconnected with the hobby, you know, okay. some of the same advice that you just gave, I got from like Tony and Zan was, well, who did you like? You know, who's somebody that you can connect with? And I was like, well, I like the big guys, you know, The Rock and Stone Cold. And I mean, those were were some of our favorites too. But then there was this piece of, I want to try to find somebody that I might be able to get almost every single one of the cards that they have. Absolutely. And Norman Smiley is not the most popular wrestler. Yeah. And so- all of his stuff, even some of the lower serial numbered autograph type stuff was still very reasonable. And I'm like, you yeah. know what? I'm just going to go after after Smiley. And so that's kind of well, what then, prompted then me. Then he turned to... up years later at the Performance Center. And I said, oh, there's Norman Smiley again, who I'd never really known. And I was thinking when when it came up in your podcast, whichever one you had, where you mentioned him, I said, well, that'll be great if like Panini puts out a Norman Smiley valuable, like a white prism Norman Smiley yeah. all of a sudden, you know, and that'll be great for you. Yeah, I'm I'm wondering if if there's going to be a point where he yeah. makes it into any of these new Panini sets because up to this point he's he's not been a part of any of these um 2022 sets that that came out. Funny, so another, he, he hasn't come up in anything recently? I don't all? not that I'm aware of. No, okay. I have not seen him come up in any of no, the I, I I can't say that I've seen him either, but I'm yep. just curious about that. Well, never say never. There's no reason they they would have the rights to make a card of him if they still wanted to if he's still on a contract. Sure. Even still, yeah. if they only if they have the images, they yeah. can do what they want, right? So it's possible. Yeah, I'm so sure we'll you have. The, I, I'm sure you have those WCW magazine ones from England. Those ones, that whole set is great because those are images that you don't see anywhere else, including the Norman one. Yep. Yeah, I finally was able to track down one of those um, this yeah, last year, but that was a tough one to tough one to get. Yeah, a couple hundred bucks a sheet now. Like they're not cheap. Yeah, I don't have the full sheet. I just have the loose the loose yeah. card. I, I have. I think there's six sheets, and I have four of the six. Okay. In fact, I was at Tony's in Arizona this past weekend. He had one of those, so it was almost when he was not looking going to try and pitch it. But I thought, no, that <laughs> that one he that one he catch me on. <laughs> Very cool. Well, yeah, thanks for thanks for asking. But that's the story behind me and Norman. So hopefully, hopefully cool. at some point, um, I'll be able to track down. I'm at the point where I need, only need a handful of the really low serial number stuff and some of the one on one type stuff, which I may or may not ever see. You know, but you know what? You do have the largest PC now. <laughs> I might. I might. Yeah. Cool. Well, where can people find you if they want to connect with you and, and see what you've got going on? Yeah, the, the website is um, www.wrestlingcards.ca or thewrestlingcardpriceguide.com. I do most of my uh, jabbering about on Twitter and my handle is uh, underscore or at card. Uh, yeah, it's card underscore guide. Okay, very cool. Well, thanks again for coming on today. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll stay in touch and, and yeah, connect absolutely. soon. All right, All right. Thank you. Yep. Talk to you later. Bye.